All right, good morning. Good morning. So all of you out in the lobby, come on in. We've made a uh, significant push to be here more on time at 11. So for those of you who are here, thank you. Thank you. We'll bring that up again uh, when we get a little further into the service. So uh, as you know, during the summertime, we're doing uh, some announcements at the beginning of the service. So I wanted to give you a few of those things that are happening. So uh, the first big announcement you need to know is this. Um, so we'll go ahead and click that one. There you go. Uh, September 2nd, we're going to have this gigantic uh, all-church network kind of party. Uh, we're going to have one service at 10 o'clock. Uh, we're selling tickets for this. We're going to bring in food vendors and all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, the tickets for this go on sale today. So you can go right on to lfachurch.org. You can click the banner at the top or click the little pop-up block. Uh, and you'll be able to buy your tickets that way. So they're $8 a person or $30 a family. Uh, if you are one of those that you don't do technology and you want to buy tickets, just write a check for it. Uh, and in your memo, include the total number in your party. Uh, we need to know how many people you're bringing with you. Uh, so if we don't have that number, we won't know how many tickets to set aside for you. Uh, so September 2nd will be that. So letting you know that that's happening. So men, the guys... Bacon, Saturday, 8.30 a.m. at Christ Community. Enough said, right? All right, all right, cool. You guys know about that. Men's breakfast happening. Uh, we have a baptism course that we're going to start on August 12th. Uh, so if you have some questions about baptism, we would love for you to uh, join us for that course, uh, find out a little bit more about that. And then this week starts our last week of summer ministry. So we're going to be here for Camp Grace. It's going to be right here at this site. So this is going to be the first time we get to do Camp Grace in the new facility. Um, so it's going to be a really fun time. So um, kids, K through 6, we'd love for you guys to bring your friends with you, come and hang out with us, uh, and then we'll go from there. All right, so I'm going to put up something on the screen for you. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this first, and then I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to make a declaration together. Uh, I want us to get into the habit of bringing some creeds, bringing some prayers, bringing some things that are some things that we'll learn that will be some anchor points to help capture our faith. Um, because sometimes when things are hard, you need those little nuggets to hold on to. So uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we get some of these into our normal rhythm. So one of these that we're going to get into our rhythm is the Living Faith Alliance Faith Declaration. Um, so this is how this goes. It says, we believe Jesus died for us to forgive us, and to use us to bless others. We believe Jesus died to make us the new people of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit as an outpost of the kingdom of God in this world. Therefore, we will pray, not my will, but yours be done. We will minister to God in worship. We will minister to each other through our gifts and talents as we live in community together. We will minister to the world by proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel. So take a look at those for a second. If you're willing, I'm going to have you read those with me out loud here in just a moment. Those are significant statements that we want to make sure that we believe and that we will, we will purposely and intentionally seek to do those things. So this may be a statement of prayer, a statement of faith, or even a statement of reality, depending on where you are today in your journey. So I'm going to have you stand with me. We're going to go back to that first slide, and we're going to make a declaration together uh, as a church body. So let's declare this together. We believe Jesus died for us to forgive us and to use us to bless others. We believe Jesus died to make us the new people of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit as an outpost of the kingdom of God in this world. Therefore, we will pray, not my will, but yours be done. We will minister to God in worship, and we will minister to each other through our gifts and talents as we live in community together. We will minister to the world by proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel. And so right now, we have an opportunity to minister to God in praise and worship. So I want to invite you to raise your voice and exalt your God this morning. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. And I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted in I.
will shout your praise. Would you praise him this morning?
you sing this next part? What were the mountains in your life that he helped overcome? Remember those? And sing this out. Testament, they would do things where God would encounter the people and they would set up stones or set up some places like this where they would they would pray and they would mark as memorials for God. So we built this building that these steps would be a place where we could come and we could remember God, where we could meet with him. So I don't know if you know or not, um, but this would be good information for all of you to know. We do have this thing in our church called a prayer chain. Uh, it's email-based, so you would email prayer at lfachurch.org, or you can write your prayer requests on your Connect cards, and we get them that way. Uh, but there have been just tons of hard things lately coming across our prayer chain. So whether that's a death of a family member, um, you know, I saw one for like a cancer treatment that didn't go very well. Um, you know, there's, there's a little kid that was in the hospital. Like, we've seen just, just really hard things on the prayer chain lately. And so I wanted to open up this space this morning for anybody that you have something hard or even something I didn't even mention um, that's going on that you're feeling the weight of or you're carrying. I want to invite you to come and pray uh, because I don't want to be... Uh, a leader or have our church be a church where we don't have firsthand knowledge of God meeting with us, right? We don't want to just tell old people's stories. Like we want to tell a story of God and his people that are alive and well today for all are alive to Christ. So I, this little verse from Habakkuk just stick out to me this morning. It says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day. Like in our time, make them known. Why not this morning? So whenever you're ready to come and pray, just come. So I'll give you a minute. Just come now, and we're going to take some time, and we're going to pray together as a church. There's a lot of stuff going on in our church, and sometimes we don't have time to talk about it all on a Sunday morning, but um, we, can always, we can always pray, and I want to make sure we have a chance to do that this morning. So you guys can come up here. You can stand. You can kneel, but let's, let's spread out all the way across um, and we're going to take some time. We're going to call out to God. Think of his words that say, as we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So let's seek him this morning. Let's let this altar be a place of remembrance and a place of meeting with our Father.
Jesus, I just want to call out to you and I want to say we need you. We need you in every moment. We need you in every situation. So God, whatever we're carrying this morning, would you meet us in the midst of that? Would you let us be a church that firsthand experiences your loving touch, the outpouring of your grace, the flow of your mercy, that we would be a people, God, like when you walked this planet, that would be in awe of you just speaking words, of you just touching people, of following you around and watching you do what only the Father told you to do. May we be a church like that. So God, we come and we pray this morning. The call is for things that are just hard or weighty on us right now. So whether that's dealing with death and grief, just to physical weakness or even emotional sadness, whatever the range of those things are, God, would you draw near to us right now? Would you speak words of comfort? Would you speak words of hope? Would you speak words that would call us closer to you, that would even awaken faith in us, maybe if it's even for the first time? So God, we want to look to you. We want to cry out to you. We ask you, God, that you would draw near. So God, I'm going to stop talking for a second. I just want to ask you to speak to everyone here this morning, especially those that are praying. Would you speak a word or just a phrase of truth? Jesus, you said that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. So there is no reason that in these days that we should not or could not know you. So would you help us to turn our hearts to you, to hear your words and respond, to bring the burdens and cares of our hearts to your feet and cast them on you because you care for us. So renew in this day May this day here in July of 2018, we will say our God met us here this morning and that is something that we cannot forget. So God, would you continue to give us moments to be with you? Would you continue to speak words of truth and comfort? So God, I specifically wanna pray for those carrying physical illness today that you would, you would stretch out your mighty hand and that you would bring healing, uh, that you would bring hope um, even if that hope is only just the truth of the resurrection, but would you continue to speak and touch? So God, I ask that you would help us, help us to hear your words today, help us to continue to cry out and draw near to you. So would you do your works in our day, make them known in our day, that we would be a people that can say we know our God. So give us first-hand knowledge, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys can stay and pray as long as you want. We're going to continue um, in a time of worship. I'm going to have the, the ushers come. They're going to take the tithes and offerings. Um, we're going to dismiss our kids first through fourth grade, so you guys are free to head out in the back here. Um, I just want to say thank you, church, for doing that. Thank you for, for supporting and giving and praying. Um, God's doing a lot of things in our midst, and I want to keep crying out for that. So we're going to stand together. If you've been sitting, let's stand up. Uh, we're going we're gonna to cry out and just continue to offer our hearts to Jesus in this time of worship today.
please remain standing for the reading of God's word. You remember how we lived in the lands of Egypt and how we traveled through the lands of enemy nations as we left. You have seen their detestable practices and their idols made of wood, stone, silver, and gold. I'm making this covenant with you so that no one among you, no man, woman, clan, or tribe will turn away from the Lord our God to worship these gods of other nations and so that no root among you bears bitter and poisonous fruit. Those who hear the warnings of this curse should not congratulate themselves thinking, I am safe even though I'm following the desires of my own stubborn heart. This would lead to utter ruin. The Lord will never pardon such people. Instead, his anger and his jealousy will burn against them. All the, all the curses written in this book will come down on them and the Lord will erase their names from under heaven. The Lord will separate from them all the tribes of Israel to pour out on them all the curses of the covenant recorded in this book of instruction. Then the generations to come, both your own descendants and the foreigners who come from distant lands will see the devastation of the land and the diseases the Lord inflicts on it. They will exclaim, the whole land is devastated by sulfur and salt. It is a wasteland with nothing planted and nothing growing, not even a blade of grass. It is like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord destroyed in his intense anger. And all the surrounding nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to the land? Why was he so angry? And the answer will be, this happened because the people of the land abandoned the covenant that the Lord, the God of their ancestors made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Instead, they turned away to serve and worship gods they had not known before, gods that were not from the Lord. That is why the Lord's anger has burned against this land, bringing down on it every curse recorded in this book. In great anger and fury, the Lord uprooted his people from their land and banished them to another land where they still live today. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. In the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses I have listed for you, and when you are living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take heart all these instructions. If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul all the commands I have given you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. Let's pray. Lord, in this place, we just acknowledge that we need your help. We need your help to hear your word. We need your, heart, we need your help to have a soft heart to your word. We need your help to have our hearts be shifted in the ways that you want to shift them. And so God, we cry out in this moment um, for this time, for these next 20 to 30 minutes that you would come to this place, that you would open up a door for your spirit to move. And Lord, we don't wanna walk as a church through a sermon series and turn back and feel like that we forget what it was about or that was a nice sermon series or just kind of like, well, whatever. Lord, we want to look back on a sermon series and feel like, wow, the Lord set me free of things and I can remember the wonders of the Lord and I remember the way that he set me free and there's enemies that aren't a part of my life anymore and I worship the Lord for his grace and his mercy and his covenant to me. So, Lord, we ask for your mercy to fall in this place on this people and for your healing and rescuing and freeing work to come to your people and that we would be a people that um, 
that over and over and over we wouldn't be turning to other gods, but that we would be turning to the living God and that we'd, we would remember your works of the past and we would see your current works for today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sarah. You can have a seat. Well, I'm Pastor Greg. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, I'm also Pastor Greg. For those of you who I have met, stays the, <laughs> stays the same. Um, so I am going to be preaching this morning. I'm excited to, to do that. Uh, this has been uh, an interesting summer for me. Uh, I have uh, been trying to follow as much as I could uh, the World Cup that just uh, finished up two weeks ago. Uh, and um, I, I, enjoy, I, enjoy watching, I enjoy watching the World Cup, as does uh, most of the world. Maybe you're not a big soccer fan, but uh, maybe you did know this, though, uh, is that uh, the World Cup, you have to qualify for it, and the United States did not qualify for the World Cup tournament. So uh, I was not able to cheer for, uh, for, for my country, for, for my team uh, in, the, in the World Cup. So I had to adopt some other countries and, and cheer for them. Um, but uh, the, the U.S. did not. And so one of the reasons that the United States did not qualify, it's not because uh, the United States doesn't have good athletes. Uh, it's not because the United States doesn't have uh, athletes that have the technical ability to, to dribble, to shoot, or to pass. Uh, but one of the criticisms of soccer players in the United States is that they have a very low soccer IQ. They're not intelligent soccer players. And so what that means to have a low soccer IQ is that um, to use your athleticism, to use your technical ability on the ball, you have to be able to do that very quickly. You have to make fast decisions, and uh, U.S. soccer players are not known for being able to make fast decisions. Uh, soccer is, is, not, uh, is, is called a player's sport. Um, so what that means is, uh, you know, there, there are coaches, and, and the coaches give, give principles, but it's not like, you know, they're sending signals of, you know, when to hit, how to hit, uh, what kind of pitches to hit, um, when to steal bases, or calling plays out on the field uh, like a football coach would. Uh, those, those, are, those are tremendous coaches in that, but soccer coaches, they give principles, uh, and then the players on the field have to be able to apply those principles in the, the millisecond seconds of the game and that's where the U.S. seems to fall short is having that ability to make those quick decisions so in a soccer game in the middle of it you have to decide what's my position defensively what happens if we win the ball on attack how do I pass how hard do I pass the ball and all of these things are decisions that you're having to make constantly throughout the game and and each moment is a little test of decision making ability so players on the field have to take the lead have to initiate in a given moment and make decisions they don't have coaches that are calling out things for them to do they're having to make those decisions in the split seconds uh, that they have. And so in those fractions of seconds, they're taking the initiative uh, and, they're, and they're making those decisions. Um, so it's a, player's, it's a player's game. And that's one of the things I like about soccer uh, is because I think soccer is very much like life um, where we have our mentors, uh, we have the people that teach us, we have the people that, uh, that, 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 that offer us counsel, but we're in the moments having to take initiative, having to step up and, and provide leadership in a given moment. And, and we have to make those decisions, we have to make those, we have to make those calls. Uh, and so repeatedly, uh, we're called upon to insert ourselves and figure out, all right, what is it that we need to, what is it that we need to do? And like I said, we have, we have people that give us counsel. Uh, we have people that offer us advice, but, but we are empowered as decision makers. And so maybe if you think throughout this year, you've probably had a number of different little tests, little, little leadership opportunities that you needed to step into and make a decision. You had to make a call. 
Uh, and, and it could happen in a variety of different environments. It could be related to your schoolwork. How much are you going to study? How much are you going to engage as, as a lecturer is coming your way? Uh, how much are you going to um, step into and invest in relationships or in friendships? Or, or maybe in, in a relationship, you're, you're having some tension. So what are you gonna do about that? Are you gonna step in? Are you gonna insert yourself and, and bring loving confrontation? Are you gonna distance yourself? Are you, are you stepping into those moments? Perhaps, perhaps it's a crisis. How are you gonna respond in times of crisis when that, when that, when that news comes or, or news comes to somebody else? And how are you going to engage that? What, is the, what are those, those, those moments for, for leadership initiative? Uh, maybe as a parent, you're facing a parenting puzzle. Uh, and you don't know how to address a certain situation. Are you going to step in? Are you going to engage? How are you going to lead in that particular moment? It could also be that God has given you vision for, for something at Living Faith Alliance Church. Maybe he's awakening in you uh, a, 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 like eyes to see a certain need and inviting you to step in and to, and to bring your gifts and your strength and your initiative. How are you gonna respond to that? How did you respond to that? Maybe it's a need in your neighborhood or in a community or, or in, 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 some, in some point of, of contact that you have where you're seeing brokenness and there's this opportunity for you to take the lead. Are you stepping up? Are you, are you withdrawing? How are you engaging that? So those are your leadership opportunities, your leadership challenges. And so this morning, what I wanna talk about is how's our, how's our leadership IQ? How's our leadership intelligence in those, in those moments? And I think God has, God has some things that he wants to tell us uh, about those particular moments and how he's inviting us to take initiative, to step in and, and, offer, and offer our leadership. And so today is about uh, God wanting us to grow in our leadership IQ. And there's, there's certain things that I think he needs to tell us in order for us to engage in those little leadership challenges, those little tests, how to engage those uh, entirely differently. And so we've been studying the book of Judges. Uh, we're now into our fourth week uh, in, the book, uh, in the book of Judges. And today we're gonna be in Judges 4 and 5, and we're gonna be studying the, the story of Barak and Deborah uh, and how God used them. And so we're gonna look at their lives so that they will be able to train us uh, in these leadership challenges to increase our leadership IQ. Now in this series, not only are we walking through the book, uh, but we're looking at certain themes, theological themes. And so there's four main themes that we're gonna circle around in this, in this particular book. So in chapter one, we saw the theme that God wants to be king over every area of life. He desires wholehearted obedience. Pastor Chris led you into, into that. And what we saw is that the people were obeying God, but they were obeying God through um, half-hearted obedience. And so there was a lot of compromise. And so there was a result of that half-hearted obedience was really uh, partial blessing. And so then you move on to the chapter two. We learned about this cycle in the book of Judges where there is this unconditional and conditional aspects of God's promise. So there are certain things about God that just says this is true no matter what. There's other things about God that says this is true depending upon, depending upon you. And so it, he desires wholehearted obedience, but as God gets partial obedience, there's times where he will withhold blessing or give us over to desires that are even destructive for us. And then in chapter three last week, uh, Pastor Chris uh, taught through three different judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Uh, and, and in those judges, we saw this picture that, that with each judge, uh, with each judge, it's going to point to a true aspect of a true savior. So no judge is perfect, but each judge has an aspect that they bring that points us to the need of a true savior. And that's the best that godly leadership has to offer us. And then in chapter four, and five, which is what we're covering today. So we're gonna see that there's always a cost. There is always a cost to compromised leadership or compromised obedience. There's always, there's always a cost. 
So just like last week, when we looked at the imperfect judges and we saw how in those imperfect judges, we got to see perfect things about Jesus. This week, as we look at uh, some imperfect, an imperfect judge and then a good example of a judge, we're gonna get to grow in our understanding of leadership. So judges four and five, uh, we're gonna be increasing our leadership IQ in three ways. I think there's three things that God has for us uh, this morning that he wants to teach us in regards to in regards to leadership. And like I said, it's gonna come through the positive example of one, which is Deborah, and then the negative example of Barak. Uh, and we're gonna see that they face certain tests and we're gonna get to see how they responded to those, to those tests. So here's the first point. And the first point I, uh, I think God wants to teach us this morning about leadership uh, isn't found actually in this particular chapter. It came up in, in when I taught Judges, the beginning of Judges chapter three, and it's this that tests of your leadership are enormous opportunities for growth, that God designs tests for, for, of your leadership as a way for you to grow, as a way for you to mature. Uh, leadership tests are not simply pass-fail, but they are opportunities ordained by the Father for you to grow. So we saw this in Judges chapter three. So I do wanna pull back a little bit and look at that verse to remind you of what we covered before. Now, these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. Let me, let me explain what that means. So the, the generation before had seen the battles that Joshua had fought, had seen God do mighty things in, in crossing the Jordan River. And, and, and we sang about the, the walls of Jericho coming down. They had gotten to see that. Those were tests of their faith that increased their faith. But this next generation that grew up did not know God nor the works that he had done for his people. So God says, I'm leaving some people in the land so you have the opportunity to face those battles, to have those tests so that you too can be trained in war and your faith can increase like the generation before you did. So God creates these tests for them so that they would be able to grow. These, these leadership tests are an opportunity for them to grow. So God leaves certain nations. Pay attention to the five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Bel Hermon as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel. So now we turn to the very next chapter, right? Chapter four, and we're gonna find that there are one of these Canaanite lords that are in the land and it is now a test that God here in chapter three says, they are placed there to test you. And so that's exactly what we're gonna see here in chapter four. So tests of your leadership are enormous opportunities for growth. So now look here at Judges chapter four, we get into our passage. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's the cycle. After Ehud died, that's what Pastor Chris talked about last week. The Lord sold them to the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. Remember, God was gonna leave some of the Canaanite lords for testing them. That's exactly what's going on here. So God is testing them through Jabin, the king of Canaan. Now, Jabin has a commander of his army whose name is Sisera, okay? And Sisera lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. That's, I'm glad that's not my address, all right? Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord uh, for Sisera had 900 iron chariots. He had the weapons of mass destruction. Like this was very intimidating, 900 iron chariots um, that he used to oppress the people of Israel with, okay? And so this story is gonna revolve around two, two quasi-judges, one judge, Deborah, and the other almost judge, Barak. And we got a photograph. Uh, this was taken with an iPhone 7. Um, I don't know why I said that. So um, 
you have Deborah and Barak. So those are the two, those are the two characters um, that God is going to uh, use uh, in this delivery. And, and so Deborah is going to get an A+. Plus. She's going to keep on growing as a leader. Barak is going to get a D. Now, Barak gets a D. I don't give him an F because he doesn't completely fail. But he's compromised, and you're going to see that. You're going to see that quickly. Um, and so, as we know, there are consequences for compromised leadership. All right. So we have two other points about leadership that we want to learn uh, this morning, and we're going to learn them through the story of uh, of, of Deborah and Barak. All right. So I'm going to read that to you. I'm going to read it from the Message version. Um, you can follow along there. I recommend you have your your Bible out so you can take notes as we go along, and then I'm going to make my points um, using a, 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 different, a different translation. Warning, uh, this is one of those stories in Judges. It gets a little, a little grisly, um, and you know, it is, it is, this is the result of brokenness. This is the result of sin, so uh, Judges kind of looks pretty clearly at that brokenness, and God in his grace even works within uh, the brokenness of our world. So this is probably like a PG-13 rating on this particular story. So the people of Israel kept right on doing evil in God's sight. With Ehud dead, God sold them off to Jabin, king of Canaan, who ruled from Hazor. Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim, uh, was the commander of the army. The people of Israel cried out to God because he had cruelly oppressed them with his 900 iron chariots for 20 years. Deborah was a prophet the wife of Lipodoth, she was judge over Israel at the time. She held court under Deborah's palm between Ramah and Bethel in the hills of Ephraim. The people of Israel went to her in matters of justice. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, it has become clear that God, the God of Israel, commands you, go to Mount Tabor and prepare for battle. Take 10 companies of soldiers from Natali and Zebulun. I'll take care of getting Sisera, the leader of Jabin's army, to the Kishon River with all his chariots and troops, and I'll make sure you win the battle. Barak said, if you go with me, I'll go, but if you don't go with me, I won't go. And she said, of course I'll go with you. But understand that with an attitude like that, there'll be no glory for you. There'll be no glory in it for you. God will use a woman's hand to take care of Sisera. Deborah got ready and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together at Kadesh. Ten companies of men followed him, and Deborah was with him. It happened that Heber, the Kenite, this this is kind of a, seems like an aside story right here. It happened that Heber, the Kenite, who had parted company with the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' son-in-law, Moses' in-law, he was now living in Zananamim, Oak, near Kadesh. There, they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera immediately caught up all the chariots to the Kishon River, 900 iron chariots, along with all his troops that were with him in Horish Hagoim. Deborah said to Barak, charge. This is the very day that God has given you victory over Sisera. Isn't God marching before you? So Barak charged down the slopes of Mount Tabor, his 10 companies following him, and God routed Sisera, all those chariots, all those troops, before Barak Sisera jumped out of his chariot and ran. Barak chased the chariots and troops all the way to Herosheth Hagoim. Sisera's uh, entire fighting force was killed, not one man left. Meanwhile, Sisera, running for his life, headed for the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. Remember, we just talked about that he had pitched his tent somewhere. So Jabin, king of Hazor, and Heber the Kenite were on good terms with one another. So Jael stepped out to meet Sisera and said, Come in, sir, stay here with me. Don't be afraid. So he went in with her into the tent. She covered him with a blanket, and he said to her, Please, a little water, I'm thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk, gave him a drink, and then covered him up again. He then said, stand at the tent flap. If anyone comes by and asks you, is there anyone there? Tell him, no, not a soul. Then while he was fast asleep from exhaustion, Jael, wife of Heber, took a tent peg and a hammer, tiptoed toward him and drove the tent peg through his temple all the way into the ground. He convulsed and died. Then Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to greet him and said, come, I'll show you the man that you're looking for. 
And he went with her there, and there he was, Sisera, stretched out, dead, with a tent peg through his temple. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. The people of Israel pressed harder and harder onto Jabin, king of Canaan, until there was nothing left <clears throat> of him. Wow, that's quite a story. That's quite a story of, of God's deliverance of his people. Um, so the second point, the first thing we learned about leadership is that our tests are opportunities for us to grow. They're tremendous opportunities for, for us to, to grow as, as leaders and to increase our faith. The second thing uh, that God wants to teach us in terms of leadership is that God wins victories through leaders that God wins victories through leaders. And we're gonna see, we talked about uh, the role of Deborah. We talked about the role of Barak. We talked about the role of jail. We talked about where tents were set up. And, and God wins victories through leaders. And so let's first look at Deborah, right? So God wins through Deborah's wisdom. It wasn't Deborah's might. It was Deborah's wisdom. Verse four told us that Deborah was a judge. She was a prophetess, the wife of, of Lipdoth. She was judging in Israel at the time. And so she settled disputes by wisdom. So it said that she would sit under the palm of Deborah. My guess is it wasn't called the palm of Deborah, but you know, she's like, oh, where should I meet? Oh, I'll meet at the palm of Deborah. It was probably named that afterwards. So she would meet at this palm of Deborah. People would come from all over Israel to sit and hear her judge disputes and to, and to settle matters because she, she would listen to God and she would offer to them wisdom. Which by the way, this is how she points to the true judge that is to come, right? What do we learn about Jesus? Is that he is a wonderful counselor. So this is a picture of the wonderful counselor that is to come. To come, Deborah is that picture of Jesus here. And so she gives God's word to Barak to gather an army, right? She tells him then even when to strike, gather the army and then, then wait for it, wait for it. Then she tells him when to strike. Uh, chapter five uh, retells this same story through a poetic lens. And in chapter five, we find out that, that the, the picture is that all of Israel ceased until Deborah arose as mother in Israel. So God used Deborah to win his victory. I wanna point out that Deborah rallied a team in her victory. She knew her limitations. She's the only judge in all of the book of Judges that doesn't wield a sword. She doesn't, she doesn't go into battle, but she leads um, through wise counsel and she rallies people around her and mobilizes uh, Barak in the accomplishment of what God had said to do. So she leads through wisdom, judgment, and sensitivity to the voice of God which we would say, yeah, that's, that sounds right, right? God would win victories through people like that. But we also see that not only does God win victories through Deborah's wisdom, but he also used Barak, right? God used, God used Barak's faltering faith for him to, to win his victory. So remember verse eight, verse eight, Barak said to her, I will only go if you go with me. His obedience was conditional. She said, this is the word of the Lord for you. And he said, well, that's not enough for me. You have to come with me in order for me to obey God's commands. It reminds me of Judah's compromised obedience uh, in chapter one. If you remember, he did a similar thing when God said for him to go up. He said, well, I'll go up if you know, this other tribe comes with me. But God still won his victory through Barak's faltering faith. Remember the way that God told him? Uh, God said for him to go to, uh, go to this mountain. And so he has the high ground, right? And so uh, Sisera hears that uh, Barak is rallying Right, all of these troops. So he thinks, well, let me get my 900 chariots, all of my soldiers, and I'm gonna go just wipe them out. And so he pursues them to this place, but God had set it up. 
right? God had set it up. And so perhaps, uh, again, in chapter five retells the story poetically and it talks about the torrents that God had sent. So it could be that the Kishon River had risen because of rain and there was mud so that whatever God did, he rendered these 900 chariots of iron useless in the battle. But so Barak had the high ground and at some point he had to rush down the hill. Right, so Barak had to get into the battle. And so we assume that the chariots are somehow stuck or they're not usable, why? Because Sisera, when he flees, he doesn't flee on one of his iron chariots, he gets out and he takes off running. Right, so something, God did something through Barak's advance in delivering the army, right? In delivering the army uh, under Barak's sword. So Barak did demonstrate some great faith in charging down the hill. And so then he pursues Sisera. And when he pursues Sisera, like the text is very clear. So he's pursuing this great general, this great uh, army captain. He pursues him. And when he finally catches up with him, it is jail, this, this woman, not even a Jewish woman that says, here, let me, let me take you to uh, see what I've done in winning this victory. Right, so he doesn't even get the, the satisfaction of, of winning the victory because his obedience has been, has been compromised. But I think the point is clear here is that God is winning the victory through the wisdom of Deborah and even through the faltering faith of Barak. It is God that is winning the victory. God is going to win his victory either way. I wanna sit on that point for a minute. God is going to win his victory either way. Chapter four, you could say, is written from the historian's perspective. Chapter four is written from a perspective of who are the generals? Where do they set up their tents? What kind of army do they have? Right, that's, that's chapter four. It's written from the historian's perspective. In chapter four, as we read through the story of Deborah and Barak, you know how many times God is mentioned in that? Two times. Two times in, in the chapter telling that story. Then when we turn to chapter five, the poet's perspective is no longer about the generals. It's no longer about where we're tense set up. It's about what's happening behind the scenes. And when they retell the story from the poet's perspective in chapter five, 15 times God is mentioned because God is the one pulling the strings. God is the one that is in charge. God is the one that is, that, that is, that is behind the scenes making it work. Why? Because God is the one who guarantees the victory. Now, next time you're facing your leadership puzzle, your leadership challenge, I want you to remember point number two, God wins victories through leaders. God doesn't win victories because you're competent. God wins victories because he is. So through the wisdom of Deborah or the faltering faith of Barak, God wins victories through his leaders. So whether we get the, the historian or the poet, and I think those two perspectives are really good perspectives for us. If we could look at life from the standpoint of there's things that we have to do, the historian tells us we're, we're agents in the drama, we're actors in the play, that we have leadership responsibilities and our actions have consequences and we walk by faith and there's battles that we have to fight and there's commands that we need to obey. But at the exact same time, the poet teaches us that God is the one in charge, that God is the one who wins the victories through us an incredible truth that the Father will win victories through you. Let me give you two stories. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I got a call. I was actually watching an Eagles game. Eagles were doing really poorly, and I got a call from my sister, and it was in regards to my parents who are on vacation in the Smoky Mountains. Some of you have heard this story. They're on vacation in the Smoky Mountains. They called my sister and my sister reported this. I got a call from mom and dad. They wanted me to tell you and KJ that they love you. Um, and, and that was it. Like they were kind of saying, saying goodbye. 
And what I found out is that there was a fire in the Smoky Mountains and they were, they were literally trapped in it. They had gotten in their car. There was no way they could not get out. They were completely surrounded uh, by this forest fire that had come up quickly uh, and had come rushing down the mountain and had surrounded the, the place uh, that they were staying. And uh, so I tried to get on the phone, tried to call, you know, whatever emergency personnel that I could get a hold of in, you know, in New Jersey. And uh, I found out that, you know, all emergency personnel were already notified. They were mobilized. This was a huge, uh, uh, this was a huge fire. And so I really had nothing that, that I could do. And so I just sat down and said, guys, we got to pray. And so I started praying. Didn't know how I was going to pray about this, um, but I just, I just started praying. And when my parents tell the story, uh, at that point in time, because I was able to track on the GPS where they were located, and they were stopped, and they had been able to drive maybe a half mile, surrounded by fire, uh, and they couldn't get out. Uh, and at that point, they were just, they couldn't go anywhere. So they were parked. Uh, and so we were praying. And as I started to pray, I remembered Jesus commanding the wind. And I said, Jesus, you, you command wind. So would you speak to the wind and, and open up a path for them? Yes. And you know what happened? Yeah. The wind shifted. Jesus spoke. And they said it was like the, a doorway opened up in the flames. And they, were, and they were able to drive out to safety. That wasn't, that wasn't a glory to Greg, right? But God won his victory through the prayers of me and others that were just saying, God, you're, you're in control. Uh, last week, um, it was Tuesday morning, and my sister uh, and her family live in Idaho, and we were all meeting in Arkansas for my nephew's wedding. There's nothing in Arkansas, by the way, other than that wedding. Um, so we were going to meet in Arkansas. My wife uh, and my two youngest ones were going to go with my mom. So it was early Tuesday morning. They were going to leave early uh, and head out there. And so uh, my mom was there picking up uh, uh, Angie and, and two of my kids. And uh, my mom's phone rings as she's trying to, she said, well, well, can you just answer it? So I answer it, and it's my sister. And my sister, uh, it, her son is the one getting married. And then her oldest son uh, was traveling in Vietnam uh, and had called and let her know that he went to the emergency room uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, they had told him that he had a partially collapsed lung. Uh, and he was in this room with all of these other people. And uh, they hardly spoke English. He spoke zero Vietnamese. Uh, and uh, they were also speaking technical jargon. So he felt like he didn't understand what was going on, was very nervous, had been there about 24 hours at that point, uh, really didn't have any information. And so she shares this with us uh, from a mother's heart, uh, and she's feeling very vulnerable. And so I'm listening to this information. You know, I'm, I'm some pastor in South Jersey. There's nothing that, that I can do. Um, so I'm just listening to my sister, and I just say, hey, can, can, we, can we pray together? That's, that's all I have to offer. So can, can we pray together? And so we pray. And I just say, God, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't even really know how to pray, you know, protect my nephew. And then I just thought lines of communication. So I said, God, would you just open up lines of communication? I don't know how, like Tracy feels completely distant from what's going on. Could you just make a way for her to have access? She's in the medical community. She, you know, she understands medical things. Just give her access to, to what's going on with, uh, with TJ uh, all the way across the world. Um, and so a, a few hours later, uh, I got a report back from my sister that she had talked to my brother-in-law's cousin who worked with Wycliffe missionaries who happened to know somebody who was a pastor in Ho Chi Minh City, and they got a hold of that pastor. That pastor happened to have a doctor in his congregation uh, that 
had visited Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on multiple occasions, which is where my sister's from, was able to go and be with my nephew, uh, help clarify the diagnosis, be in communication with my sister, brought him home, gave him snacks from Idaho that she had brought uh, with her uh, at her last visit. Uh, And then it just so happened that there was an American pulmonologist Uh, that happened to be in that hospital on that day uh, that they were able to connect with as well. I mean, that's not because, that's not because like I know how to pray over communication issues. That was just simply that God wins victories through his people. Like that's the way God set it up. Why he does it that way, I don't really know. But by his grace, he set up our world that as we participate with him, God wins victories through us. So my nephew was able to come home, be at the wedding in Arkansas. He's now uh, back home uh, with his mom, being able to get the treatment that he needs. But, but it's this incredible pattern that God has that when he wants to win victories, he invites us to be part of it with him, that he wins victories through us. All right, my third point, my third and final point uh, about us growing in our leadership IQ uh, that God has for us through this story is really best understood in a question. So when God wins the victory through you, the question remains, to whom will you give the glory? This isn't really a theological question. God will ultimately get the glory. This is more a worship question. To whom will you give the glory? So who gets the glory when God wins his victory through you? This is a theme throughout this story. Remember what what Barak said, right? When when Deborah comes to him and, and gives him the word of the Lord, right? He says, I'm not going to go. Right, So he said to her, if, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I will not go. That's a strong statement. right? So I, I don't care what God said. If you don't go with me, I'm not going. So at that moment, who is Barak putting his hope in? Who is Barak putting his trust in? Who is Barak giving the glory to? Well, he's giving it over to Deborah. And so Deborah responds, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And so that's exactly what happens. Uh, as I told you before, uh, you, you know, we, we went through the kind of the grisly details of how God did that. And it was the woman who received that glory. Jael was was the one who destroyed this great general, Sisera. I mean, Barak led the charge down the hill. He faced the iron chariots, but it was Jael that, that actually brought deliverance. She defeated the enemy. And in chapter five, when the poet sings about the victory, Listen to how it goes. This is part of chapter five with the poet retelling the story. Then, then sang Deborah and Barak, Right, so it seems like he's, he's getting in on the glory a little bit. Uh, the, the son of uh, Abinoam uh, on that day that the leaders led in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings. Give ear, O princes, to the Lord. I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord. The, the, the I there is the feminine singular. That's Deborah, not Barak. So Barak is mentioned. Actually, Barak, uh, the verb tense is a passive tense. So he's not doing anything. So all of the glory here is not going Barak's way. It is Deborah is the one who is active. And then later on, it says this. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. So the glory did not flow to Barak, but the glory flowed to Deborah. You see, when you are confronted with a leadership test, when you're confronted with the leadership challenge, at that moment, you will give glory to something. At that moment, glory will flow from you to something. And either by faith, 
you will accept the invitation of God to walk in what he has revealed to you and to give glory to him. You will see yourself come alive to the call of God, to walk in the adventure of faith, to see God pour out the gifts of his spirit as you walk in what he's called you to do. He will give you things you didn't know that you had. Like God, God will do that. Do you, do you know that? That, that God, as he invites you to take steps of faith, he will provide you with what you need to accomplish the purposes he's called you to do. I mean, there's so many stories that, that, that we tell around here of God doing that exact thing. Like I was really tight with my finances, but I sensed God inviting me to take steps of faith in, in, in giving or, or in tithing. And then, and then God started to provide in ways I didn't anticipate. Right or or so, uh, you know, the, just limited resources. God inviting you to use them, and then God multiplying. So so you either have that option, right? So when you're confronted with a leadership test, at that moment you're going to give glory to something. So you either give it to God, right, or you give glory to something less than God. You give glory to something else. You give that glory over to some other thing. Did you notice we've been using the, the little icon here, the fig leaf? Right, that was the first time that we gave our glory over to something else in the book of Genesis. And the shame that came by giving glory over to a woman or from a woman giving glory over to, to, to some other thing that's less than God brought shame. And the fig leaf was what? Adam and Eve grabbed hold of to cover their shame. So why do we do this? Why do we give our glory over to something else? The, the text really doesn't answer that question. Why did Barak do it? Why did Judah do it in chapter one? Why do we give our glory to things that are less than God? When the, when the leadership challenge is, is in front of us, why do, why do we shrink back? Why do, we, why do we hide from it? Why do we trust in something other than the voice of God? I would guess, I would venture to say, bottom line is fear. That, there, that there's something that we fear. So maybe for Barak, it was... I. Like, I fear those 900 chariots. So unless you're with me, I fear failure. Or maybe it's I fear the, the loss of control. You're asking me, God, to step into something. It's too messy. I don't feel like I could get my arms all the way around this. Or I can't think through all the details and figure this out. Maybe we fear not being enough for the task at hand. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe we feel like we're a little bit too much and it's gonna overwhelm people if we bring our strength, if we bring our gifts to whatever the leadership challenge is in front of us. But the bottom line is we give our glory to another and we settle for far less than what God has designed us for. But maybe you think, I mean, it seemed to work okay for Barak, right? I mean, he was able to, to win the victory. I mean, sure, he didn't get the glory, but it seemed to work out for him. So what do we really miss out on? I think there's two things that we really miss out on when we give our glory over to something else. What we miss out on is growth. We miss out on maturing in our faith. Deborah got to just keep on tracking with God. She got to keep on growing with God. So we miss out on the opportunity for us to mature in our leadership and in our faith. But I think the greater tragedy is this. When we give our glory to something else, so when Barak put his hope in Deborah instead of to God, he misses out on what his life is designed for. Your life is designed to give glory to God. Your life is designed to point to the greatness and perfection and power of God. And when we shrink back from those leadership opportunities, we miss out on living life to the fullest. We miss out on living for what we're made for. We miss out on our design when we shrink back from what God has called us to. So how do we make sure 
that we don't give our glory to something less than God? How do we make sure that we don't give our glory to another? I think the example of Deborah gives us a, a framework uh, that should help. So what did Deborah do? Well, she was somebody that would, that would listen to God. She was attentive to the voice of God. So when she looked at the situation in regards to uh, the, the Canaanite king, she was listening for what does God have to say about that? And so she would then listen to God, consult his desires, and then seek his resources. She would speak into situations. I think often for us, we fail at step number one. We don't, we don't acknowledge that God's in control of a situation. We, don't, we, we functionally live life as uh, an atheist would, like things just happen. That's lucky, that's unlucky. Instead of, there is a God. Chapter five, the poet teaches us that there is a God that is in control of all things. So we start with, we get confronted with a leadership challenge. Start here, acknowledge God in confronting our next leadership test. That God, that God is present, that, that God is here. And then ask the question, what does he want? What is he looking for? What, is God, what does God desire of us and then tap into his resources. Like God, you like you own a cattle on a thousand hill. Like you you, God, you you are in control of all things. You have everything we need for life and godliness is ours in Christ Jesus. So let's tap into the resources that God has for us. So you are going to be challenged with a leadership test. And I want you to remember three things. That test is an enormous opportunity for you to grow. Second thing I want you to remember, in that test, God will win victories through you. The third thing I want you to remember is the question is, as God wins his victories through you, who is going to get the glory? Here's how I'd like us to end. Uh, these are faith talks that you can pursue later on in conversation, uh, but I'd like you to give some thought to them right now. First thing I want you to ask is, what are the leadership tests that are in front of you? What are the leadership challenges that you are facing? What are, those, what are those puzzles? Maybe it's in uh, where you work. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's in an area of ministry. What are the leadership tests that you are, you are confronting? And in what ways have you said yes to God in those leadership tests? In what ways have you, have you stepped in and, and leaned into God? Or in what ways have you leaned into something else? In what ways have you given glory to another? Yeah, could I have the worship team come up? So in what ways have you put your hope in something less than God in confronting those leadership tests that are in front of you? All right, so I want, I want you to think about those. I want you to have uh, those leadership tests in your mind uh, as we move towards the end of the service here. Uh, and it's gonna, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to receive prayer over those leadership tests as a way of starting uh, following Deborah's pattern. But let's just get before God on this particular test. Let's, let's acknowledge that God is here. Let's seek his resources over this leadership test that is in front of you. All right, so that's how we're gonna end this service. So right now, I just wanna give you uh, some moment as Christian and the team plays that you can be thinking about these faith talk questions. You can have conversations about them later, but for now, just be thinking about those. Uh, and then uh, Pastor Chris will come up and lead you in a time of being able to pray over them as we would grow in our leadership IQ, that God has things that he wants us to know about himself as we confront these leadership tests that our faith would be able to increase.
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save stand with us. going to ask our prayer people to go ahead and come forward. Um, I'm going to give you two things this morning. Um, one is I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and pray, uh, but two, I want to also challenge you not to leave this place today, not just this room, but this whole place, without sharing what your leadership challenge is. Because um, the truth is, we don't usually talk about it this way, every one of you is a leader. You're leading something. Even you kids are leading something. Like, you're leading your own heart. Like, you're leading other people. You're influencing things. Um, 
there's always somebody to be led. And we have to understand that. We have to step into that. Sometimes there are even books out there talking about leading people who lead you. <laughs> there's an influence that's on your life um, that you have to bring before God. Bring that. Be aware of that. So whatever your leadership challenges are, that could be a wide range of things. That could be a work thing. Um, that could be a relational conflict between a parent and a child. There's a lot of leadership out there. There's a lot of ways. And one of the things that judges is teaching.